number of available sexual partners for a given male, your best predictive measure of that is income. And the best predictive measure of that is intelligence and conscientiousness. And so what happens is that males orient themselves in groups and then they compete and then women peel off the top. And so, and so the women are in a position of judgment on men and the judgment is the judgment of nature. Now, from a Darwinian perspective, you know, when we think of nature, we think of like a friend, it depends on who you are, but like if you're an environmentalist, you think of a French impressionist landscape, you know, forgetting that nature is also malarial mosquitoes and cancer and all those, and you know, rats infected with bubonic plague and all those other lovely things. Um, but from a Darwinian perspective, you can define nature much more straightforwardly and more accurately as that which selects. Now, you know, you hear a lot about natural selection, and natural selection basically assumes that there are a random distribution of alterations in genetic structure in any, in any population, in any generation, and some of those random alterations will be more suited to that particular environment, suited being they'll live and they'll reproduce, and genetic transformation takes place across the millennia as the organism chases the landscape, roughly speaking. But Darwin, you know, Darwin, who's an unbelievably intelligent person, was also very, very interested in sexual selection. And as far as Darwin was concerned, sexual selection was just a, as powerful a force in modifying genetic structure, modifying and driving evolution as um, natural selection. And that's been very underplayed by biologists. And that's only started to switch maybe in the last, I would say, it hasn't switched that much yet, but it only really started to switch probably in about the last 25 years. And that's because the idea of sexual selection makes things a hell of a lot more complicated. You know, because, well, first of all, you know, in the standard Darwinian account of evolution, there's no place for mind, right? There's no place for a creator. There's no place for teleology, and teleology is something moving towards an end, a goal, right? But the thing is, if sexual selection is operative, and if consciousness is ancient, then mind has been operating through sexual selection as long as there's been sexual selection. I mean, so you think, you think, do you have any choice? Do you make any choice in who your partner will be, a sexual partner will be? And the answer to that is, well, it's hardly random. You make a choice. And what's interesting is that, you know, if you take 60 people, let's say if you took 60 women and you asked them, you showed them a bunch of men and you asked them to rank them in terms of their attractiveness, there's going to be fairly consistent rankings. You know, I mean, we know what makes up attractive facial features for women and for men. You, it's easy to determine that. What you do is you take 60 faces and you, you average the features. So you don't get the average person because the average person is more like a median. You get the averaged person. And the averaged person has perfectly symmetrical features that are nicely shaped and fairly big eyes and, and, and they're, they're very, you know, they're very nice looking. They're very attractive. And so that means that there's like a central human form in a sense that we're, we find attractive. And we see this in other species. For example, there are butterflies who won't mate with another butterfly if it's, if it's like a 16th of an inch out of symmetry, because then it's not a butterfly of that type, you know? And, and that's how people think too, is the more you deviate from the averaged person, the less canonically human you appear and the less attractive that you appear. And so, you know, we're chasing this ideal in some sense that's an emergent property of the nature of our species. And then, you know, there are certain physical characteristics, um, wide shoulders in men and narrow waist. In women, it's waist to hip ratio is a very common marker of beauty across cultures and across body types, interestingly enough. So. 
if you take thin women and heavier women and you get men to rate the attractiveness of the women within that category, the heavy women and the light women who have a hip waist to hip ratio of about 0.68 are the ones that are judged most attractive physically. And so, and that actually correlates, by the way, with fertility because the abdominal fat in a young woman is a sign of ill health and also a marker of decreased likelihood of conception. Now, none of this is operating con consciously, obviously. It's, it's deeply wired into us. It's part of our immediate perception. But it still does indicate that there is an ideal, like a platonic ideal, lurking at the back of our minds against whom we compare everyone that we meet. And then you might say, well, what's the nature of that pla platonic ideal? And that's a very, very complicated question. You know, I would say that I would say that you could you could almost literally claim that the well you can certainly claim that the ideal male is represented in mythology as a hero. So and that's actually what mythology is about. It's about representing ideal patterns of behavior. So it's hardly surprising. And so you know if you go to a movie and it's a romance and there's the main lead character that you're supposed to fall in love with if you happen to be the kind of person that would fall in love with that kind of person, then he's going to act out a, partic a particular pattern of behavior. And the pattern of behavior is quite identifiable. So for example, he's going to be, he's going to move forward and explore and not hide and cower. And the probability that he's going to be creative is very high, and the probability that he's going to be good looking and strong is very high. And so, those are archetypal features. And those aren't all the archetypal features, because those are, in some sense, those are the, those are the self-evident ones. But, you know, people are also evaluating each other for such things as intelligence and personality and character. And you could say in some sense the men are competing to be the best man and the women are watching the male competition to to take the man who wins on the presupposition that he wouldn't win if he wasn't the best man it's a very very intelligent strategy you know because why not outsource the problem you let the men sort it out well it's too cognitive too cognitively complex to compute you could say that the male dominance hierarchy is equivalent to the stock market it's exactly equivalent to the stock market. It's the, like the stocks are, stocks are always competing with one another and with every other commodity for primacy of price and value. And that's exactly what happens with male competition.